What's up guys and welcome back to another very, very special episode of Shark Bites. That's right, today we're finally going to be talking about my Nurse Shark paper. For those of you that have followed Shark Bites for a little while now, you'll have seen over the last 18 months or so that I've been working on this Nurse Shark paper quietly in the background. When you're doing the research for and then writing a scientific publication, it generally stays pretty hush-hush until it's finally published. And that's just because we don't want to get the results leaked, so it's got to be kept pretty private. But as of very recently, this paper is now published and online available for you all to read and that means I can talk to you about it. I did post it on the community tab for those of you that wanted to read it ahead of time but as promised today's episode is going to be all about this research paper. Think of today's Shark Bites episode as kind of like a creature feature mixed in with a new research episode I suppose. First things first though big thanks to all of my collaborators on this one that's Beneath the Waves over in the US, Austin Gallagher and his team over there, Big Blue Collective in the Turks and Caicos Islands, Exeter Marine and all of my co-authors. Research papers are always a team effort so so big thanks to you guys for all of your help. Okay, the paper, right. Let's jump in. So to give you all a little bit of a backstory, I want you to think back all the way to 2020. The world was gripped by the pandemic and Shark Bites was well and truly in its infancy. I'd been doing some work for Beneath the Waves, analyzing some Brubs footage for them, trying to identify different shark and ray species. For those of you that haven't heard of Brubs before, it stands for Baited Remote Underwater Video Systems. And essentially what these things are, are little rigs that we drop to the sea floor. It's got a camera on it and then a pole with a bait canister attached full of fishy goodies. And that basically looks lures in any marine predators like sharks and rays and then the camera manages to capture them on film. Generally, bruvs are mostly used in science to look at abundance and distribution of different species. So for the shark stuff that we were doing, initially we were looking at what kind of species were cropping up and how many of them there were. Because it was during the pandemic, unfortunately I wasn't able to get out to the Turks and Caicos Islands in the Caribbean. But thankfully the team at Beneath the Waves were able to get out there and drop these bruvs all around the island. There's not much shark and ray research that's come out of the Turks and Caicos, so when the team were dropping the bruvs, we weren't exactly sure or what we were going to get on them. But those waters are inhabited by a fair few shark species. We got mostly Caribbean shark species and in pretty high numbers too. We're talking Caribbean reef sharks, lemon sharks, black nose sharks, tiger sharks, and of course, nurse sharks. So as we were going through some of the footage, I started noticing that the nurse sharks were doing some weird shit on camera. <laughs> Initially, I was just sat there watching and laughing at them because they were being so strange and reacting way differently to the bait cage than any of the other shark species. Most of the other sharks would just come along hit the bait cage hard, rag it around a bit, and then swim off. Whereas the nurse sharks were spending much more time around it, coming at it from different angles and really trying to figure out that bait cage. A lot of the time they were just rolling around, bonking themselves on the bruv or the sea floor, hanging upside down. It was really, really funny to watch. So at the same time I was noticing this weird stuff going on, Austin and his team spotted a really cool piece of footage of a nurse shark that almost looked like it was using its pectoral fins to walk along the sea floor, kind of positioning itself at a better angle to get into that bait canister. I think that's when we realized that something different was going on here. So I went back through the files and started analyzing each time a nurse shark visited one of our bruvs. And when you start seeing these videos back to back, you start to notice patterns. When I was watching them all spaced out in between clips of other sharks, it just looked like the nurse sharks were booping around the bruv. But watching the clips back to back, it became pretty clear that the nurse sharks were all feeding in a very similar way. Some of them were feeding vertically in the water column with their heads down like that. Others were feeding on their backs upside down. And lots of them were were doing this interesting thing with their pectoral fins. So we decided to describe these feeding behaviors. Basically, we broke them down into four feeding behaviors and one non-feeding behavior. So up first, we've got the pectoral positioning behavior, which we've loosely termed as walking. I'm saying that with quote marks there, but you can't see me right now, of course. More on the walking stuff later. <laughs> Anyway, pectoral positioning here is where the shark is using those pectoral fins on their side, bending and flexing them and pushing them off against the sea floor to try and move its body into a more favorable position around the bait canister. So then we've got the vertical feeding behavior. So this is where the shark is pointed head down with the rest of its body vertical in the water column, using its tail or caudal fin to keep it balanced in that position. Next up is the ventral feeding behavior. So this is the kind of funny one where the shark has sort of rotated 180 degrees and is basically lying on its back, feeding on that bait cage. Silly nurse shark. Then we've got the stationary horizontal feed. This is a pretty basic one here. The shark is lying in a motionless horizontal position on the sea floor and it's doing slow repeated suction feeds on that bait canister. And then finally, we've got the swim past behavior, which wasn't technically a foraging behavior because the shark simply just swims past and ignores the bait and the bruv. So we've got all these different feeding behaviors here, but what's the purpose of them and how are they helping the nurse sharks? Well, we wanted to see whether nurse sharks were performing these foraging behaviors in different areas or at different levels of 
of depth. So was the habitat they were in or the depth they were at influencing the behavior the nurse shark decided to use when they were feeding? To do this, my co-authors Phil and Ollie decided to create some nice and complicated statistical models, which I won't bore you with the details of. Although from those models, we did get some pretty interesting results. So the swim past behavior was associated with depth and basically the nurse sharks were swimming past and not interacting with the bruv at shallower depths, which could mean that nurse sharks do most of their feeding at deeper depths. And then even more interestingly, the stationary horizontal feeding behavior, that's the one where they were lying flat motionless on the sea floor, occurred three times more often on sandy bank habitats than it did in coral reef habitats. Now, why might this be, I hear you ask? Well, we think that because the sandy bank habitats are generally pretty flat and sandy, the nurse shark doesn't have to use one of its more complicated foraging behaviors to try and get that food out of the bait canister. It can simply perform the stationary horizontal feed to get the bait. So in those habitats where the topography of the sea floor isn't that complicated, like for example, a sandy bank, the nurse shark chooses to use a foraging behavior that expends minimal energy. Lying flat and motionless on the sea floor is bound to use less energy than any one of the more complex behaviors. And as we know, it's vital for sharks and rays to conserve their energy and only expend that energy when they really, really have to. So what about the other behaviors? Well, we can't say for sure because we couldn't prove it with the stats. But what we do think is that those more complex behaviors like vertical feed or ventral feed might be being used by nurse sharks in the more complex habitats like coral reefs where the seafloor topography is much harder to move around in. In the wild, nurse sharks' normal prey species might be things like small fish species or crustaceans. And these prey species are pretty good at hiding from a big bulky nurse shark. They'll hide underneath rocks or crevices or corals that can be quite tricky to get to if you're a two meter nurse shark. So what those nurse sharks might be doing is using a more complex foraging behavior like ventral feed or vertical feed to try and reach prey species that are hiding underneath the rocks and crevices. Picture a rocky overhang on a coral reef that's got a few different hidey holes for small fish or crustacean species. Sometimes the best way to get to that prey might be to lie upside down on your back, squeezing your mouth and head into that hole, just like we see in the ventral feeding behavior. So having this wide repertoire of foraging behaviors makes the nurse shark a pretty important predator in tropical seascapes. The different foraging behaviors allows them to feed in a variety of habitat types like sandbanks, coral reefs, seagrass meadows, mangroves, and they can adapt their foraging behavior to the specific habitat type that they are in at that point in time. And that means that nurse sharks are really important in controlling the energy flow through that ecosystem. It's the foraging behaviors that allows them to do that. I think that's pretty cool. Is it just me? That's pretty cool, right? So we haven't really spoken much about the pectoral positioning behavior, which was the one I referred to as walking in quotation marks earlier in the video. Now we have to be careful here because the definition of walking can be pretty loose. And if we were basing it purely off the footage that we've seen in today's video, what we're seeing is a very loose definition of walking. But having those really bendy and flexible pectoral fins has to be for something, right? When we look at the majority of shark species, most of them don't have the same levels of flexibility in their pectoral fins as nurse sharks do. And it turns turns out that nurse sharks actually have specialized skeletal and muscular adaptations in those pectoral fins to enable them to bend them like that. I won't go into the nitty gritty morphology stuff here because it is a little bit complicated, but they basically have a larger number of shorter intermediate and distal segments in those pectoral fins that gives them that flexibility. And also the tissues within those fins have really high concentrations of something called chondroitin sulfate, which is really elasticy and stretchy. And it's these two things that combine that create a pectoral fin that can bend and twist and flex enough for the nurse shark to be able to use them as appendages like we would use our hands or feet. Walking in sharks has only been documented in a few different species, but most notably you'll have seen it from the epaulette shark. These are the little sharks that can use their pectoral fins not only to walk on the sea floor, but also out of the water too, scrambling over rocks and corals. And it turns out that nurse sharks and epaulette sharks are actually in the same shark order, the Erectolobidae. So they're somewhat relatives of each other, at least in comparison to other shark species anyway. And because they're related, it might mean they have similar adaptations within those pectoral fins that allow them to perform this walking behavior. The jury's still out on whether nurse sharks can walk and it's likely they'll never walk in the same way as epaulette sharks do, i.e. out of water. But perhaps we'll get some more footage in the future of nurse sharks walking along the seafloor. Now, I wouldn't be a good shark scientist if I didn't talk to you about the limitations of this particular study. There's always limitations in studies and it's important that everyone knows them. So using bruvs is great. It's a really cost-effective way to study animals underwater. But the biggest issue with using 
losing them, especially when you're looking at shark behavior, is the fact that they're baited. This is, of course, a non-natural interaction because we're using food to lure the sharks in. And we couldn't say for sure whether these behaviors would still be occurring when the bait wasn't there. We think it is, but we can't know for sure. But the issue is that it would be really, really difficult to get natural observations of this without the bait. Sometimes it's difficult to find sharks. They're elusive little buggers. So the sheer amount of time that you would have to spend underwater looking for the particular shark species and then seeing that behavior would make collecting data on this virtually impossible. Some of the other limitations were that we couldn't differentiate between individual sharks on the bruvs. Apart from occasionally being able to tell whether a particular shark on camera is male or female, it's really, really difficult to differentiate individuals from one another. So we can't tell if certain individual sharks are appearing on multiple bruvs performing all of these behaviors. Maybe it's only three or four individuals that are doing this type of foraging, which obviously wouldn't be an accurate representation of the whole nurse shark population. Admittedly, to counter for this, we did drop our bruvs in several different locations around the Turks and Caicos, but again, it's just something to consider as a possible limitation. Overall, there's only been a handful of studies that have used bruvs to monitor behavior in this way. So this is a really cool groundbreaking way to study marine animals, and particularly animals that we don't really know that much about. A lot of the previous research that had been conducted on nurse sharks had mainly focused on their reproductive behavior. So using bruvs in this particular way to learn more about how they feed and how they forage is actually pretty new and exciting. And moving into the future, we think that bruvs can be used in this way on a case-by-case -case basis to monitor and study the behavior of sharks that might be difficult to find. Wow, okay, there we go, guys. That's my nurse shark paper. The best part of the last two years of work, reviewing footage, analyzing data, creating graphs and figures, writing and drafting the paper, battling with journals and reviewers, all condensed down into a 10 or so minute Shark Bites episode for you. I can't tell you how pleased I am to finally get this paper published. It's been a long time coming. And this is the life of a shark scientist. It's not all the glamour of being out in the water with sharks all the time. There's so much hard graph that goes on behind the scenes that people just don't see. But if I didn't love it, I wouldn't do it. What do you think of this Nurse Shark paper then? Any good or a load of rubbish? <laughs> Please don't say it was rubbish. <laughs> I want to know what all of you think though. Do you reckon nurse sharks can use those pec fins to walk? Have you ever seen a nurse shark before? Let me know in the comments below. And as always, if you enjoyed this video, please, please do give it a like, especially this one. I'd really appreciate it. And don't forget to subscribe to the Shark Bites channel below by clicking that big red subscribe button. We can stay up to date with all of our latest videos. Until then, see you next time.